All right, hypothalamic and pituitary agents. So some of this section is pretty interesting and very clinically relevant and useful, and some of it is very ambiguous and sort of a little bit of minutia. I'll try to point that out. We have uh, most of it here for completeness sake, but as, as Mina liked to joke last year, this, this section showed up, parts of it drove me to madness because I really hated it. And then parts of it were really cool and interesting. So let's see if you can figure out what I like and what I don't like. So we'll start out with some pretty relevant stuff with some pretty important physiology. So our gonadotropin releasing hormones, these are our hormones that are coming from the hypothalamus, hypothalamin, and they are attacking our pituitary, where it would be anterior, posterior, depending on the hormone we're hitting. So GN and RH agonists, luprolide, glycerelin, hysterelin, nephrelin. So at least three of them have sort of that suffix that you can try to use. So as I've spoken about before, these are acting on the anterior pituitary, and these are G protein coupled, G Q mediated IP3 calcium receptors. Not for this test, but for the big one, you may get asked that. That would be a sort of a. <laughs> that's going to be the. Oh, what's it called? That's going to be a savage question if you get one. That's a savage question. They ask you if it's GQ, GS, or whatever. So the physio principle is going to be similar to how we talked about the parathyroid releasing hormone. So when GnRH is pulsatile, this causes an increase in FSH and LH, two hormones coming from our anterior pituitary. This is physiologic. However, if we give continuous GnRH, we actually reduce the amount of FSH and LH and provide negative feedback. That's how these drugs are used. These drugs are primarily used continuously as blocking agents, even though they're agonists. We're using them to block FSH and LH. Therefore, our uses, precocious puberty, early puberty, endometriosis, polycystic ovarian syndrome, syndromes where estrogen and testosterone may be too high, uterine fibroids before surgery, we'll give them a GnRH agonist gonadal steroid prostate cancer, and that's the biggest one. That's the test question. They're going to ask you, you have a man coming in, and you know he gets started on this new agent for his prostate cancer, and you know he comes back, and it, it's gotten bigger, or he's having symptoms of like high testosterone. That's because when you initially give these medications, you have a flare, because at first there was a spike, because you're giving an agonist, and so you'll get increase of FSH and LH. So initial flare is very important to remember with GnRH agonists. And we prevent this with antiandrogens before giving it. In addition, one of the other things we can use this for is we can actually cause suppression of our LH during infertility treatment to uh, allow for a spike. So in this case, what we're doing is we're giving it, I, I don't know the exact timing of it, but what we're trying to do is we're trying to make it so that our body has that LH spike around day 13, 14, and then we really have a nice ovulation and an egg gets released. We can also use it uh, to suppress puberty in uh, patients who are transgender and inhibit uh, puberty from occurring so that they're able to transition as they get older. Symptoms, obviously, of taking this drug is going to be hypogogonism and there can also be detrimental effects on the bone mineralization and lipid profile. Very important physiological principle to know. Lots of questions on your world and on your step. This is this is uh, like a little concept that they like to trick you with because it's an agonist, but if it's given continuously, it decreases FSH and LH. So that initial flare is a side effect that we don't really like. Therefore, let's use GnRH antagonist, gonadotropin releasing hormone antagonist. We have ganrelexin, cetrolexin, and degrelexin. Again, nice suffix, so it's easy to remember. These are antagonists that work more specifically in reducing LH greater than FSH. Um, as I had previously stated, they're developed to avoid the flare phenomenon observed in GnRH agonists. Unfortunately, they don't work that well. 
So we don't use these. We still use the GnRH agonists. They're just, they, they work better for whatever reason. But if you're given specific questions, they can be used for infertility to inhibit a premature LH. So, you know, we can have a controlled ovary, uh, ovulation in women. And then Degrelix is actually specifically used in advanced prostate cancer. But for the most part, I want you to remember GnRH agonists are uh, primarily used, not GnRH antagonists, even though they both do the same thing. Ah, moving on, another very important lots of clinical correlates. Now we're going to be talking about vasopressin or ADH, antidiuretic hormone. So we have the actual you know, analog drug, arginine vasopressin. This one, it can act on the vasopressin 1 or vasopressin 2 receptor. Vasopressin 1 is GQ, vasopressin 2 is GS, GQ is IP3 calcium, and then GS is cyclic AMP. Again, not so much important for this test, but for the big one. Po big importance for this test is V1 is primarily located in the GI, but more importantly in vascular smooth muscle being our vasculature. V2 is the site of the receptor in our, to, in our renal collecting tubules that induces aquaporin. So V2 is renal, V1 vasculature. I guess you could say V2 got two kidneys, so V2 is kidney. Anyways, we can use this, we use this primarily for shock and hypotension. Vasopressin in and of itself is, um, is used for, uh, be, be, so, uh, I don't have this here, but I, sh I should. Um, vasopressin in and of itself is much more, um, has much more affinity for the V1 receptors than the V2. So you have to go at very high doses to get V2 receptor activation. At that point, it, you're literally vasoconstricting your vessels. So because of that, we created another drug that has more renal selectivity, desmopressin. But for now, when we talk about actual arginine vasopressin AVP, we're just gonna use this for shock and hypotension because of the V1 effects. Therefore, what are some of the things that can happen? Well, vasoconstriction, specifically if we worry about the coronary arteries and heart attack, and also because it works on smooth muscle in the GI, you could have a little diarrhea and stimulation of the GI symptoms. In addition, interestingly enough, it cross-reacts with the oxytoc oxytocin receptor because as we know, posterior pituitary oxytocin and vasopressin stimulates uterine muscle contraction, which would not be good in a pregnant woman. So just a little side note. Now we move on to our next vasopressin or antidiuretic hormone analog desmopressin. So this has a longer duration of action and it has renal selectivity. So it has selectivity for the V2 receptor. So what do we use this for? Diabetes insipidus. So we are replacing absent ADH, whether it be well, in, in this case, central, it's, you know, we're not making it from uh, the posterior pituitary. But uh, yeah, so in this case, we're replacing absent because we're going to use it also to differentiate between central and nephrogenic. So in our nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, our vasopressin receptors on our kidneys don't respond to ADH. So to differentiate, if we give them desmopressin, well, do they... Do they concentrate your urine? If they don't, that means you know the kidney is not working. If they do concentrate the urine, that means they don't have the ADH coming from the uh, coming from the posterior pituitary. We can also use it for nocturnal enuresis and usually young children who unfortunately have a problems wetting the bed. And then the other key testing point, very very important, we can use it in von Willebrand disease. Our little bleeding disorder because of a lack of von Willebrand factor, desmopressin causes von Willebrand factor to be released from endothelial cells. Very, very important. I don't know why that's in pathoma. That's everywhere. They just love you. To, they need you to know desmopressin is a treatment for von Willebrand factor disease. And I think it's just because of the weird mechanism and how it just randomly causes that. But anyway, big teaching point. Uh, so now we talk about a syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion. We talked about diabetes insipidus, a lack of ADH for whatever reason. 
now we have SIADH, an increase, an inappropriate release. And we talked about that on our first question. So this is an inability to excrete free water leading to hyponatremia and hypoosmolality, which we saw in that first patient. Causes can be ectopic neoplasms, most likely causes. You can have CNS trauma and infections. So I wanna just take a moment. You can have trauma that can cause, to, you can have a, a, a head trauma that can cause central diabetes insipidus. There's this idea that, you know, I don't know what it is, but you know, you get hit in the head, there's a stress response and your posterior pituitary does not make ADH. But you can also have an increase of ADH secretion. So just keep that in your mind. Uh, endocrine diseases and then high yield culprits uh, drugs are cyclophosphamide, SSRIs, and carbamazepine. Her treatment, as we talked about it before, was um, water restriction. Tends to be the textbook answer as you restrict their water intake. It still doesn't get better. We can use tolvaptin. I believe we talked about this before. This is a, a vasopressin 2 antagonist, so an ADH antagonist on the V2 receptor, and demiocycline, not desmopressin, demiocycline. This is actually a tetracycline analog, tetracycline being those antibiotics like doxycycline. This reduces the sensitivity of our V2 receptor to arginine vasopressin or ADH. Can be nephrotoxic, so we do need to monitor. All right. Now we move on to a few other agents that there are some things that you should know, but I think we're getting a little bit deep into the weeds here. So growth hormone or somatotropin. And then we also have somatotropin, which is a recombinant human growth hormone. As you guys all should know, human growth hormone has a mitogenic and anti-apoptotic effects, growth hormone. Metabolic effects include increased triglyceride hydrolysis, increasing protein synthesis, and insulin resistance. This all eventually leads to increased collagen, increased skeletal growth, and increased soft tissue growth, growth hormone. Um, we tend to give this subcutaneously before bedtime to try to mimic normal secretion patterns. In kids, we use this for patients who have a growth hormone deficiency. If you guys are soccer fans and you know of the soccer player, Lionel Messi, on Barcelona, it was believed that he was a little bit shorter, so he was actually given, I believe, in it, or he's from Argentina, he was given some growth hormone supplements when he was younger because he was so short. So, you know, in some, you know, we do it in clinics, in some kids who we think are, aren't following their growth curve, we can actually give them growth hormone. It's a little bit controversial. And um, in other conditions that may have led to impaired growth. In adults, we can use it in adults who have growth hormone deficiency, but you know at this point it's a little too late because as you remember, you know they're uh, at this point once they've gone past puberty, a lot of those you know a lot of those effects are going to be permanent. And then also we can use this for HIV-related wasting or cachexia. Uh, very few side effects in a, children and adults and peripheral edema and myalgias. We also have mecarcerin. This is a recombinant insulin-like growth factor res receptor agonist. So it mediates the effects of growth hormone. It activates the IGF-1 receptor. This receptor leads to autophosphorylation, which is something very similar that happens to uh, an effect when we give insulin. So therefore, that's why it's sort of this insulin-like growth factor and pretty much just mediates the effects of growth hormone. Therefore, you know, we can use this in patients who literally have a, def who have a, a treatment deficiency of this growth hormone. Um, and we can also use it if there's a growth hormone deletion because this is going to mediate the effects of growth hormone. So we could give this drug instead of growth hormone. This one's administered subcutaneously twice a day uh, before or after meals to prevent hypoglycemia because it has insulin-like effects. Uh, it should be not be given after the closure of the epiphyseal plates 
and uh, it should not be given in patients who have uh, some sort of risk of malignancy or have active malignancy. Side effects would be hypoglycemia. I mean, these two drugs, we're sort of getting into the minutia here. I would know their I would know their name, I would know their mechanism, and maybe a little bit about their uses, knowing that somatotropin is our growth hormone and we're gonna use it in growth hormone deficiency and AIDS related cachexia and um mesocaramin is our insulin like growth factor. Does some autophosphorylation, that's why it's insulin like and it mediates the effects of growth hormone. Not the highest yield. And moving on, another analog of human growth hormone, peg visonimat. Only this is the competitive inhibitor or antagonist of growth hormone. They took the lysine at the spot 120 and replaced it with a glycine, and it prevents dimerization of the receptor. A big sort of a teaching point pharmacology-wise, PEG. PEG, this little prefix, means that this drug is pegylated. What is pegylated? You guys remember polyethylene glycol, that drug that's kind of um, used for patients who are constipated? It's a long, like, you know, sugar chain. And this is literally attached to the primary structure of the drug, and it increases the half-life because, for whatever reason, you have this long sugar that's attached to, like, you know, this base molecule, and the long sugar just like prevents, you know, different molecules from coming in and interacting. So it increases the half-life and it actually, for some reason, makes the drug, uh, you know, less rejected by the human body. The human body sees it less as a threat and so it has less immunogenicity. So if you ever see, you know, PEG interferon, that's interferon that's been pegylated, uh, you'll see, oh, what are some of the other things? Um, You'll see growth hormone, pegylated growth, sorry, pegylated, um, uh, oh, I'll think of it right now. So, uh, the, the drugs that are, uh, the drugs that are used to increase white blood cell, red blood cell count, those hormones, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the name right now, but those drugs, most of them were pegylated because they're endogenous peptides that we've recombinated. And so we can stick the peg on there, increase their half-life and uh, reduce their immunogenicity reaction to them. When are we going to use an antagonist of growth hormone? An acromegaly. In abundance, an overabundance of growth hormone. Issues, we can have LFT problems, we have liver problems. We're going to monitor our liver function tests and we're not going to give this to a patient who has already have um, high liver function tests. Diabetics may require dose reductions, again, because of that insulin and growth hormone receptor uh, interaction. Moving on, so now we have a somatotropin releasing inhibiting factor, somatostatin, and then we have our somatostatin analogs, octreotide, lantreotide, and uh, pesrilotide. So, a more C couple protein, G couple protein receptors. I'm sorry, I'll change that to a G, which uh, is a GI inducing, causing a decrease of cyclic AMP. Broad category of effects here is to decrease growth hormone secretion, decrease TSH secretion, and decrease GI peptide hormones like insulin, glucagon, VIP, and gastrin. So this is sort of an inhibiting, this is sort of our antagonist hormone in our ballet of hormones to growth hormone. So, some of the important facts about each one of these drugs. Octreotide, this is a potent inhibitor of growth hormone and a less potent inhibitor of insulin secretion. Big things we're going to use this for. Acromegaly, our growth hormone excess. We're going to use it for carcinoid tumors. Um, if you guys remember, carcinoid tumors are those pesky serotonin histamine secreting tumors that can occur in our liver and then metastasize to our lungs and cause something called carcinoid syndrome. This is what we can use to treat carcinoid syndrome until it's removed. Uh, and other things, big, 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 most important thing here is we use this for portal hypertension and GI bleeds. So in patients who have alcoholic uh, liver disease that de develop esophageal varices and portal hypertension, this is a drug that we can use to prevent 
it from getting worse. Adverse effects include reduction in bile production, gallbladder, um, contractility, GI disturbances, but I wouldn't worry so much about the side effects. I would know that octreotide is our antagonist of growth hormone and growth hormone other uh, hormones, and it is going to be used for acromegaly, carcinoid tumors, and most importantly, portal hypertension and GI bleeds. Our other drug, pancirotide, so this certain tumor cells overexpress somatostatin receptor 5. So this drug selectively binds to somatostatin receptor 5 and inhibits ACTH secretion, and which eventually decreases cortisol secretions. So this is a treatment for Cushing's disease, very specific drug. Know it for the test, don't know it for step. Um, so, and then I want you to remember Cushing's disease being a growth hormone adenoma, whereas, sorry, a, a, um, a cortisol, an adenoma, Cushing's disease is a cortisol, is an ATH secreting adenoma in your uh, anterior pituitary, whereas Cushing's syndrome is just having too much um, cortisol in your body for whatever reason. It's Cushing's disease is specific. Um, you want to use this for Cushing's disease if you know surgical treatment is not effective. Mild side effects: diarrhea, nausea, hyperglycemia. A couple of like again more minutia. I would know what I had told you about octreotide. And for this specific drug, just know that it's a treatment of Cushing's disease. Know that in tumor cells, you have this overexpression of somatostatin receptor 5, and it can be used to treat this by inhibiting that. Again, sort of more minutia. Back to some more, back to some good stuff. We have our dopamine agonist, bromocryptine and cabergoline. So these are the two agonists. Cabergoline is a little bit more potent and effective than bromocryptine. These are both ergot alkaloid derivatives. So all those people who are into the naturopathic medicine, these are two medicines that, you know, we found a natural plant in nature and we were able to take a drug out of it because we're activating the same uh, receptors that the plant was. The other thing to remember is they're a little bit more nonspecific. Even though I talked, I said they're D2 agonists, they can activate D1 as well. Uses. They're going to be last line for acromegaly and prolactin hypersecretion. Pituitary adenomas have D2 receptors that respond by decreasing secretion when activated. So we got to remember prolactin and dopamine are both intertwined. And so by giving a dopamine agonist, we're actually going to reduce the amount of prolactin that's secreted. Uh, we usually combine this with octreotide if it becomes last line. Most of the times with prolactin hypersecretion, we're going to be giving, we're going to be doing surgery, and it usually is pretty effective. Important side effects include hypertension, abdominal cramps, arrhythmias, and sleep disturbances. A few more. Now we move on to oxytocin, that other pesky hormone that's released from the posterior pituitary. Again, this works through our G-coupled protein receptor. Uh, it is GQ mediated and leading to IP3 and calcium release. Uh, so oxytocin, very, very important point, increases the frequency and force of uterine contractions in pregnant women. It can also lead to milk ejection, whereas prolactin leads to milk development. So uses are twofold. It's used for the induction of labor to increase the frequency and force of your uterine contractions, and it's also used for postpartum bleeding because it will cause, uh, when it's given in the um, antepartum setting, we're giving it to increasing the force of the contractions at a lower dose. When we give it in the postpartum setting, we give it at a 10 to 10 to 50 times higher dose. So the force is so strong that the uterus is contracting on itself and it'll control postpartum bleeding. It's actually very cool to see. Um, side effects, now if we're using it in the antepartum setting, um, uterine rupture, if uh, there were previous C-sections or just if it 
you know, if, if you're using this drug, you're, there's a possibility that the, you know, you're augmenting your uterus with contraction, so it could rupture. And, uh, you know, that augmentation of the force of the uterus contraction can cause some trauma to the baby, so they tend to not go too high with the amount they're giving in that setting. Usually, I think they stop at 20 units per hour, or whatever it is. I don't remember if it's per hour per minute or whatever, but they will have a limit on how much they will give because of damage that can occur to the baby. Three important drugs, methyl ergonavine or methergen. So this is an ergot alkaloid, serotonin, 5-HT2A. This is a vasoconstrictor, so we use this in postpartum bleeding. However, because it's a vasoconstrictor, important point contraindicated in hypertension. Diprostenone or Cervidil, this is our prostaglandin G E2. This is used for cervical ripening, so they can give a Cervidil. Uh, they can place that uh, with oxytocin in hopes of increasing the speed by which the cervix dilates. And then Carboprost or Hemabate, this is our 15-methyl prostaglandin G F2A. This is to control postpartum bleeding. This is another mechanism or way by which we can control postpartum bleeding in, uh, in a woman after she's delivered. Um, the right side, I would, I would know some of the key side effects. I would remember methyl ergonavine is an ergot alkaloid. It's a vasoconstrictor, therefore hypertension, it's contraindicated. And then I would know that uh, you know both of these prostaglandins can be used in induction of labor and controlling of postpartum bleeding, respectively. And then they love to test oxytocin as a milk injection, and then prolactin, which we haven't talked about, is milk development. We're coming close to the end. Now we're going to talk about some of the uh, gonadotropin agents. So for LH activity, we have HCG, which you all know, human chorionic gonadotropin hormone, and then we have the recombinant form of it. So just remember, HCG primarily has LH activity. There is human menopause gonadotropin, M HMG, menotropin. This has equal activities of LH and FSH. And then finally, we have recombinant FSH and urofolotropin. The mechanism of action of the LH and FSH hormone is through G-coupled protein receptors, and uh, they are through GS and cyclic AMP. So what are we going to use? What are these hormones doing? Very, very overly simplified, because we're going to be talking about this stuff ad nauseum in our next lecture. FH, FSH, primarily ovarian follicle development. LH, production of estrogen, progesterone, and induces ovulation. Extremely basic. I am oversimplifying to the 10th degree. In males, FSH uh, is primarily for producing androgen binding lobulin and maintains sufficient androgen, uh, testosterone levels. In the seminiferous tubules, receptor matter gents. <coughs> uh, LH primarily is our production of testosterone. So, the uses of these drugs, depending on whether we want LH or FSH or both. So, for women in ovarian stimulation, we can give FSH to help follicle growth and we can give LH to induce ovulation. Side effects can include multiple births and then ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. For male hypogonadism and infertility, we can give literal testosterone synthesis. We can augment that with LH. And for spermatogenesis, we actually do need both because we need the production of the testosterone through LH and then through FSH. We need to be able to maintain the testosterone level in speminiferous tubules. And then finally, in cryptotorchism, undescended testicle uh, in with no testicular response we with no testosterone response we have literal primary failure of uh, the testy so we would have to supplement with both and then in with normal testosterone there may be secondary or tertiary failure and it's a little different their treatment is a little different 